So Matt, that is a huge amount of money not to report on your income for the year, but I hope you get away with it, dude. I mean, power to you, man. Screw the government, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, oh, God damn it. Level. Tax I told season. you weren't supposed to tell anyone, <laughs> especially everyone fine. on the internet. The IRS <laughs> doesn't listen to our podcast. Uh -huh. We'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It worked out for Wesley <laughs> Snipes, right? Nobody ever gets Jesus. caught on these things. I paid my taxes, level cap. I got it in the mail. We're good. <laughs> Today was the last day. I know because my IRS guy was like, so uh, still waiting on that paperwork from you. And I was like, I sent it two weeks ago. And he was like, oh, yeah, sorry. I went into my spam folder. So nice. Yeah, I did some fun last minute running around paying Oof. stuff. Yeah, it's all good, though, man. It's all good. How you been, man? Enjoying the uh, the world of gaming? Oh, wait. Welcome oh. to the Level With Me podcast. Of, of course. course. I'm, I'm really good at intros. So we're you episode are. 34, and I'm like, do we do an intro? Like, now, later, end of podcast? Welcome, everybody. The, uh, the gaming-ish podcast where Matt and I talk about video games, current events sometimes, our feelings, life, love, loss, all that love, fun yep. stuff. Yep. Emphasis on love. Yep. And uh, if you want to support the podcast, we have a Patreon where you can come and watch the live streams. We got a couple people in here right now telling us when we mess up and when I set my recording settings wrong and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, but that is one of the things you get to do if you become a Patreon member and you get to join the Discord and give us suggestions about what to talk about on each episode and whatnot and interact with us as well while we're doing the podcast. So we appreciate you very much. It's been an interesting week. For, uh, for game has. stuff, yeah. Very interesting. Did you have anything in particular you wanted to start off with? Um, well, I kind of, there's kind of, how about a weird story? I'm always down for weird stories. I think last podcast I brought this up, or at least I've brought up this game multiple times because I like using it as a reference for sort of like good ideas or competent games that failed spectacularly, and that is Lawbreakers. Cliff Blazinski's oh, okay. last game. I think I talked about it last podcast because yeah. I was talking I'm about. I'm surprised Cliffy. he said competent though, because I thought okay. Yeah, it was uh, well comp. Well, it wasn't you, terrible, but I don't know. I don't know if it was like top tier. Continue. I'm. I'm to me, competent fine. means competent. It doesn't mean like amazing, and it doesn't Fair. mean terrible. Uh, anyway, the game is like coming back, or at least according to his Twitter account, there's people playing it right now. Somebody's like gone in and written out some sort of code that allows them to play the game on their own servers or something oh. which you know should have been done in the first place but mm -hmm. uh, i guess boss key or whoever nexon i think owned boss key something like that you know they're like the game's done forever and we're not gonna let you play it even if you want to on your own servers and so right become this sort of legend of people talking about it and it's not quite as good as like Gather the legend. Around, and I will tell you the legend. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I was reading the Reddit about this game coming back and somebody was like, oh my gosh, is this game playable again? Can I hop back on? They're like, here's the discord. Like they do play sessions and stuff, but uh, yeah. temper your expectations. The legends may, uh, may not quite do the gameplay justice, but yeah, I just thought it was interesting. It's been a topic that I've heard a lot about lately because Microsoft is having sort of this like game preservation team formed within the company that's going to try and preserve old games so that people can come and play them later because we can go back and watch old movies most of the time unless they were recorded on film and all that film is destroyed as long as they've right. been digitized and uploaded to the cloud for the most part they're going to exist forever until there's some sort of massive solar flare that kills all of our you know digital infrastructure everything just everything everything yeah <laughs> until it goes mad max and then we don't really care but yeah until then we've got pretty good backups of it but games don't really have that if uh one the original game is like you know it's on dos or something or it can't be emulated well or it's on some ancient like console that nobody has anymore or it always has to be connected to the internet which a lot of games have and that's one of the bigger problems is these like multiplayer games where you have to have huge server infrastructure just to experience the game and then they're like well the game didn't work out financially goodbye forever and then yeah, it just, just becomes this the void yeah it's just like a little footnote in gaming history and somebody's like i played a game called this and 
it's kind of what I like about YouTube is it's sort of become a documentation of some of these games to an extent because you're never going to see them otherwise. You'll never have any right. record of what they were like or if people enjoyed them or what. Well, speaking of that, did you see what happened with, with the crew in Ubisoft? Um, no, I didn't. Yeah, so this is actually a flawless transition um, because <laughs> Ubisoft lit literally just revoked the license for the crew and they were they were because the servers were going to go down. And so people were hoping that you could just drive around by yourself solo. So you could just, you know, do like a solo campaign or they could have like a, a ways of doing that. And they're like, no, you don't even own the game anymore. They literally just like st straight up took it away from your like library. So it's like you bought the game and now you don't own it anymore, which is wild. Uh, it really goes to show how digital media, you don't really own the things that you purchase and I feel like that shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there used to be a day when you would go into the game store, you would buy a box. Do you remember how big those boxes were? Those PC yes. gaming boxes? Yeah, giant. Yeah. They were like the size of an encyclopedia and you would take it off the shelf. You'd bring it home. You'd open it up. There's a lot of air inside of it because it's a huge box for no reason. Yeah, literally no reason. There'd be like a manual and a CD or a floppy mm -hmm. disk, whatever, whatever era you were buying games in. And then that game would work until that CD broke or you the lost the floppy disk or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I remember, and like they did have little DRM type stuff back then too. I remember Prince of Persia. The original, I think. They had anti-piracy um, stuff there, too. Well, really. I remember its DRM thing was, uh, it came with a manual, right? All the games came mm -hmm. with fully printed manuals that were like 20, 40 pages long, whatever they were. And each level, it would say, type in the word that is on the third line on page 21 or something like oh, that. Oh, wow. So if you wanted to pirate the game by copying the floppy disks and giving it to a friend or something... You would have to then also photocopy the entire manual really? and give it to them. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's kind of clever. But also I pirated the game. So some levels I was like, you'd be guessing. You'd be like, I don't know, Apple. Or, you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> that's great. Ah, the early days of game piracy. Yeah, the early days of the high, the high seas of the internet. <clears throat> yeah, no, this is a really crap situation with the crew. Uh, I mean, I'm just becoming aware of it, as you're saying, but. I have been aware of just the insane world of digital media and how crappy it's becoming. And I just, I tweeted this yesterday uh, mm -hmm. because I, I was just fed up with it. I bought um, Top Gun Maverick in Ultra HD 4K. You bought it. I bought the digital okay, version. So you weren't bought, renting, you just, you were, bur okay. Yeah. I wanted it. I knew I was going to watch it a bunch. I bought yeah, it on. Great movie. On YouTube, Google Play, what have you, mm -hmm. right? Um, the Google Store, which I yeah. now regret. But uh, I bought it in 4K, Ultra HD. I paid the 4K price for it, and it would go to stream it, and it uh, looks like garbage. I'm like, what's going on here? I turn on Stats for Nerds on like YouTube, and it's streaming in four, 480p. <laughs> and 4K? Like, well, I mean, it's four is something. There's a four in the number. Yeah. And I'm going, what the heck is going on? So I go down this rabbit hole of why the heck can I get this movie to play in 4K? You have to stream it on a Google-approved device, which is either a Chromecast, an NVIDIA Shield. You remember that ancient device? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, and why then the Okay, keep going. And then, like, an Android TV type thing. So you're like, okay, that's the only way you can get 4K. Yet they're selling it to anybody as a 4K product. Right. You don't have to buy it on a Google approved device or whatever. You can buy it anywhere. And they're like, here's your ultra HD video. And then you can't play it on 99% of the streaming devices out there, which is insanity. And then I look further into it. Apparently most of the streaming services are kind of like this. Netflix has got a weird thing going on where you have to cheat it to get your ultra HD quality. It has to be on like an approved streaming device uh they're really crazy about streaming on computers because they don't want people to like copy it i guess and then pirate it but they've created oh. a situation in which you're almost encouraged to pirate content now because you're like well i don't want to buy it on like this weird app thing that i have to like give you all these weird permissions 
right. through and do all the stuff that I don't like and I can't watch it on the preferred device. And if I just pirate a video file, I'll then be able to watch it on anything. So like the paid product is worse than the stolen product. And it's, it's just like becoming kind of going super backwards weird. in some cases, because I, I, I remember a long time ago, pir- I mean, it's, piracy, I think, is still probably a very big issue, but sure. especially early on for games and stuff. Um, and I think this is one thing that Valve really showed works is like as long as you have a platform where things are easily accessible, people will buy this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. They'll they'll because they'll, they don't want to do things that you have to go to a certain website. And yeah. You, pirate something people just want to do things legitimately so if you give people the option to do that they're going to do it more often than not but then when you start doing this regressive stuff where it's like oh you don't have you don't have this particular tv or this particular app it's like what are you doing make yeah. this easy what like i'm trying to give you my money like stop well i used to buy the hard copy i used to bl- buy blu-rays and the like whatever the ultra hd blu-rays mm-hmm. when they came out but those things were so loaded with ads that every time you oh, wanted to really? get into a menu, yeah, loading it up for the first time, you're like, watch four ads, oh, and yeah, some of them yeah, became yeah, yeah, yeah. unskippable. I about that. And so you're paying all this extra money for a hard copy that's supposed to have the best compression rates for audio and video. Right. Like it's almost it's impossible for streaming to really catch up to like a Blu-ray that's just like yep. gigabytes and gigabytes of video information. But you got to sit through all these terrible ads, and that's if you want some of the cool behind-the-scenes extras and stuff for a movie you really like. And it just got to a point where I'm like, I want to support this stuff, but you've made the product so awful that... And and Blu-rays were already reasonably expensive, too. It's not like they were mega cheap. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, this is sort of a, a weird tangent from the gaming thing, but... It is all kind of tied into this weird DRM trying to protect your intellectual property. You buy a digital product from a company and then it can just like become nothing after a while. I remember I used to buy YouTube videos and they used to stream in 4K on more devices. But Mm -hmm. I believe that is scaled back over time to the point where I'm like, hey, this thing I bought forever ago just doesn't stream on the things that I normally stream it on anymore or i don't understand resolution. how that's allowed slash le- especially with for the crew and like i yeah. get for like multiplayer games when the servers are offline like that sucks there's like there's nothing they can do about it right you can't have servers just indefinitely i understand that like there's a cost to that and you can't just force companies to run out of business but especially if it's got a single player component and they could maybe or you give the rights to the gamers to be like okay you can have like an you can create like an offline mod or something like that but to just straight remove it entirely yeah doesn't seem very uh consumer protected no it's really it's really bad and it just it's kind of sad because you think 10 20 years from now there's going to be games that like we played that just are completely inaccessible to people now or like you have to explain it to somebody there was a game that was like this and you could do that and be like, oh, that sounds cool. Sorry, you can never play it or st- or whatever, but... Watch it on YouTube. Exactly. You can go back and watch my videos from 10, 20 years ago on what <laughs> it was like. You can see me enjoying it, but you can never try it for yourself. I hope there becomes more of a standardized practice of designing games where the server infrastructure could essentially be transferred to a community server at some point, where... If there was enough of a community that wanted to keep something running, they could pay to have the server for it. It would be the lone server that runs that game. And then there'd be like a little cult following of that game or whatever. Or you could boot it up from time to time on. Yeah. You know, but I just don't. It sucks, man. You got all these big companies with big pockets that give no crap about the history or the legacy or baby yeah and think about being a game developer working on these games where you're like well this project was five years of my life and it didn't go that well because marketing really had a bad idea about the game or they just blew the marketing budget and they didn't give us enough time to do the thing we wanted to do and now that five years of my life is something that people can't experience anymore i can't be like hey i made this cool game and then be like oh can i play it no nah. sorry at least nah. in the film industry when a movie bombs it's still there somebody can be like i made still this exi- movie yeah but not with gaming man that that kind of thing scares me i'd be terrified to work on a huge budget game like that for years and years and years and then have literally nothing to show for it 
Well, it's cool. I, I didn't realize that Microsoft was creating some sort of team to preserve that stuff. I thought, like, I've, I've heard of individuals doing, you know, that's why they gather physical media so that they can preserve it. But I didn't know that Microsoft themselves were doing something on a bigger scale. Yeah. So they made sort of a press statement about it that was a little bit more vague, but it basically was like, we have a long he legacy of making a lot of our Xbox games backwards compatible, and we're trying to continue that on forever. And there's a lot of cross compatibility now between Windows and Xbox, and they're just really trying to make things less restrictive and more open. And now they're kind of opening up their platforms to other titles to reduce the exclusivity stuff. And then the next phase of that is basically like, well, what about all these old classic games that are <clears throat> that don't really play well, like things that were built on DOS or really old consoles or really old IPs that we've now bought and we own? How can we preserve those more? And so I think there's a team that's basically now dedicated into looking into that and saying, okay, well, like, how hard is it to get this old Microsoft game running? A huge pain in the butt? All right, let's 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 look at doing a remaster of it or, or something to just make it easy, a one-click for most most people. So yeah, I hope that's, that's cool. what it is. Um, yeah, it sounds cool. And I hope other companies follow suit because they should, you know? It's like, uh, it's history. It's important. I agree completely. So, uh, I'm curious to hear about, I, I see that you wrote Manor Lords on there. Manor Lords is like the number one wishlisted game on Steam, which is insane. Is it really? I think so. It's insane. And it's mostly developed by like one dude, right? One guy. Yeah. That's what blew me away. So I got early access. I, I got a key from the developer. Bastard. Yeah, uh, I know. I know. Uh, that was really neat. It was a little bit of a surprise. And I played it for about seven hours one night. And it's fantastic, especially for, like I, like you said, for one, a solo developer. Um, it is a city builder at its core, and you basically it's it's a city builder with a little bit of combat as well. So you need to but there's basically also like it's not completely top down, like the the catch or the big twist on it that makes this mm -hmm. number one wish list that is like this much more immersive element, right? Where you can go down and be among the characters to a degree. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that would be why it's because that's it's a really cool feature. So yes, yeah. you can create your little your little town. Uh, you can make winding roads and then you can have what's really neat is you can create homes that will then mirror the road. So if you play like city skylines or something like that, everything needs to be very grid based. Yeah. And grid based is still really important here, too, because there's a lot of buildings that are just a square and there's nothing you can change about it. You're you're like your um, buildings that like build stuff, uh, wheat farms and stuff like that. So um, those th there's there's still some square action there, but you can have like these really organic houses and fences and stuff like that that make it feel really authentic to the time period um, and more like real life which is awesome and then you can click a button and then go down and run around as your lord and just kind of vibe with your yeah. peasants and hang like, out hello which is common really cool. folk you know exactly. have you paid your taxes and stuff no you have like Matimio, a, you, have you like haven't the, paid your taxes you know you have like the craziest drip like a red robe yeah. and cape and it's just like you look incredible and everyone else is just like working hard the fighting looks really good too from what i've seen I, I didn't do a lot of the combat. It was okay. It felt a little basic, but yeah, you've got yeah. different commands while you can... So you basically have to raise an army and you have to build up the army to have certain like weapons. So you have to make the weapons and then outfit your peasants so that they have said weapons. I think the higher tier of your citizens, because you can have houses that will be like a tier two family or tier three family, they will have better stats or something or they'll be better somehow. But mm. like I said, I didn't really dive too deeply into the combat. There'll be knights um, and stuff. Yeah, so you can have a front line of like pikemen or spearmen, and then you can in the back you'll have like archers and stuff, and you can have different commands while in battle, so that you'll they'll, they'll slowly try to like move backwards to lead the to lead the enemy forward, and they can maybe get like a flank off. So there are some things going on with that where it it could be pretty involved um, if they expand upon it. But it felt a little basic. Okay. I, I won't lie, but so um, what are your thoughts after seven bad. hours? Like, um, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's 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 solid. It kind of reminds me of oh man, Anno, where you have yeah. to fulfill certain Love needs. Anno. Yeah, I, I like Anno a lot too. Where 
you need to have like a certain amount of different variety of foods if you want to yeah. get a house to the t- the next tier. So you can't just invest all into yeah. like wheat fields or something. Yeah, you need to you have eat potatoes meat. and you be happy. Exactly. Yeah, and then that higher tier, if you get if you want to get to tier three, then they need even more things to make them happy. Yeah, those those debutantes and stuff. You know, they need their their fried tomatoes on their toast in the morning and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then those tier two and tier three families can in their in their home, they become like an actual um, like a like a blacksmith. So that will be your now your blacksmith area. So you can basically make a little district. So how does it who are you fighting against and how does it interact with like the surrounding areas? Like good question, because it felt this is where things felt a little like they they not fell apart, but it wasn't as immersive because you're building like this really cool city. And then all of a sudden, yeah. out of nowhere, there'll be like a little bandit camp. It'll just be like a tent out oh, in the distance and then yeah. some enemies. And then you'll go to like war at one point. I, I click like battle and I, and I won the battle, but all of a sudden an army just showed up and I don't know where they came from. I don't know. <laughs> they, they didn't have a city. Like there's like yeah. surrounding areas around that you can't see beyond the map, which I think is where people like maybe these other factions come. Uh, but there's different territories within the actual map itself that you can, you can take over and that's how you win, I believe. Okay. And, but out of nowhere, like they'll just be like an army and you're like, Oh, uh, okay. So yeah. are you guys mad was... about something? Like what's up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's where it, it, it it's, I don't think as uh, fleshed out as it could be. And I'm sure they're going to expand upon that at some point. But overall thoughts is that it was really, really good. The one thing that stuck out to me, one of the best soundtracks oh, yeah. for like just incredible. Like every single every single track was like a banger. And it's just old, what old timey, you know, lutes and stuff like that and flutes. And it's it's really good. If you lutes haven't listened to flutes, it, I recommend baby. it. Mm-hmm. It's what I that was my go to in college right oh, it's like yeah. lutes and flutes up oh, it's charlie the lute and flute guy <laughs> i don't know how i feel about you ever, that you ever listen to pan flute music matt did your parents nope. ever go through a pan flute band phase? no they did not south park did an episode about it and i thought it was mm. very funny because i was like oh my god every every parent when i was growing up like had their pan flute band phase and nice. <laughs> you just hear it all the time you go to somebody's house and you're like all right, here we go. <laughs> Band flutes. Well, that's cool, man. I'm glad that um, that this game's doing well, and it's it's crazy to think that like these small teams are able to pump out a game that becomes number one wish listed on Steam. You know? Yeah. Good my these only people. my only concern is that now that I put seven hours, I it, it may not be an issue. Is that I feel like I'm starting to hit more of the wall of the content, like I'm. I'm, I'm reaching the end yeah. already, which yeah. is not inherently bad, but it does feel like the scale of it, maybe not as big as some, cause you can start making, you have like your main town. And then you, once you take over a territory, you can start making another smaller town that maybe specializes in, this is going to be our farming town for barley yeah. or whatever. Right. And then you need to trade between. And so maybe that'll get really complex and that'll be more interesting, especially if they add in more enemies and things like that. Um, but I did kind of feel like after the seven hours that I'd sort of experienced what the game had to offer. Mm. And I don't know how much was going to be beyond, beyond that. Yeah. I think that's one of the potential downsides of very small dev teams too, is they're like, here's our really cool idea that might be hard to get big investors to hop on board with. So we're just going to make it on our own, but also we don't have a lot of developers to make a ton of content so like we have to really be smart about how we get our content in there so i'm hoping that uh maybe they can stick with it hire some people through the mountains of cash they're about to make and uh, (laughs) maybe improve it or something like that you know i hope so because yeah they've got they've got a fun title it's it's very good mana lords that's cool man Mm mm-hmm i uh did you happen to hop on zanzo the other week they came out no with, you remember zanzo the uh i do i played it a couple of times the other world war one game that is yeah. not battlefield one um their latest limited time event mode is pretty cool it's oh, it was uh, limited time it was limited time Interesting. i don't know why it's limited time because it's really good i think it's over on the 24th or something like that but okay uh it's basically a cliff firefight so you have to like climb up a cliff with pickaxes and like put in little pitons with ropes and stuff so other people can 
climb up climb quicker. Climb up with you? Yeah. yeah, like if you put a rope down, your it improves your stamina while you climb, so you can climb faster and all that stuff. So it makes sense to make the way easier for other people or to create rats and stuff. Yeah. But there's people above you chucking rocks down at you. <laughs> So it's the that's, weird, it's that's such, an interesting mode. It's so weird because I'm like, this is a first person shooter, and then people are like throwing rocks at you, and you're like climbing cliffs and stuff the whole time. Uh, I read up on this after playing it a bit, and it's like spot on in terms of what happened during these mountain fights during World War One. Just insanity. Where there's photos of these guys i guess you know like I, I guess they had some of the early cameras back then but like they're literally they have ropes and pitons and like a dude will be hanging on a rope with like a pistol and like shooting at somebody wow. on the side of a straight up and down cliff and you're just like why you guys didn't want to just like go around and agree to fight on the other on the yeah, meadow that's what I was gonna or say. Why, why are they doing this this seems <laughs> yeah. this seems ridiculous awful Awful. It seems like the worst possible thing. And then you have to find people who are like, well, are you a really skilled mountaineer and marksman? All right, sign up, you, with yeah. your super interesting skill set. And also, it's going to be horrible and you're probably going to die. Good luck. Right. Oh, man. Insane, dude. Was yeah. it fun, though? I did have fun. Uh, the flanks are pretty solid because essentially it's like it, it's like taking a conquest map and then flipping it vertical. So yeah. all the points are along different cliff ledges That's as you go so up. so weird. And then you can climb up anywhere, right? So the guys right. are looking down trying to defend, but you'll make your own route over to the left somewhere. Nobody will see it. Then you'll get up and you'll get this sweet flank. And when you're dropping people, they're like falling off the cliffs and stuff. And people climbing up will see bodies fall down past wow. them. Wow. And you're just and guys scream as they're falling too. If you fall and you're alive, your character screams. <laughs> So you'll just hear like, Aah! like as it goes past the microphone, as it goes past your, your character. That's brutal. Yeah. So it's cool. Like it's a fun little indie experience. It's not like blowing me away with the visuals or anything because right, it is, right. is Zonzo, but um, it's a fun one, man. If you, if you need a couple hours to burn on a stream, I, I recommend that one for sure. I feel bad for Zonzo because it doesn't have like a very large player base and it's just so it's it's a it's a well-made game but it's it's an indie fps multiplayer which is so hard to like keep people engaged yeah. long term they also i mean like i totally respect their game but they go for some of the more it's Niche. not even hardcore but it's like um pacing mechanics that just aren't, aren't gonna appeal to mainstream you know like their weapon like i mean there's some of the reload animations on like their Vertelli, Vertelli bolt action rifle. Vetterly, is that what it is? Yeah, probably. Uh, I mean, like, you know, I took a shot and I swear it was like three seconds before the next one's chambering in and some dude's just like approaching at me and I'm like, reload, you bastard, you know? And yeah, it's, well, that's what makes it kind of, you know, intense yeah. and fun. Right. But I'm saying like, I think that's sort of the trade off is you have accessibility versus authenticity. And uh, it's a little more on the authentic side, but not too hard. It's not like, yeah, way over there where you're just like, I've died 20 times in a row to mortar. It's not not one of those it other can, games. Some of the maps can turn into that where you just feel like that's you're true. hitting a wall of bullets and you're just like, this isn't fun. But then there's other times where you're like, you're the one getting the flanks and you're the one getting some mm -hmm. good shots off. And it's really, it's satisfying. It, yeah. it, it's always tough to walk that line. Like you said, I yeah. think they do an okay job of it. That's kind of the indie experience, you know, where they're not like super refined maps and stuff where each side should have an equal combat experience. It's like, sometimes you just get blasted. Sometimes you're just the team that's getting absolutely owned. Feels yep. like the early battlefield days, you know, when it's just like, is there any team balancing? Remember when that was like the number one complaint with Battlefield was like, we need a team balancer. Like, this is insane. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. We're just getting steamrolled over and over again. And then you would join a server. And since there was no team balancing, the only available slots were on the teams that were losing because those people would drop out. And then you'd get in, you'd be like, why are we getting steamrolled for like four matches in a row? And you're like, well, this is just the natural flow of things because there is no team balancing. Yeah. <laughs> and it just rolls over those dominant teams to the next round. And then it just goes forever. The good old days, Matt. BF3. The good old days of Battlefield. Yeah. 
Yeah, the days that we all pine for and sort of forget some of the problems of. We do. That is that is the time has a way of 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 uh, smoothing over some of those rough edges. For sure, for sure. Um, I don't know if you saw my video on this, Matt, but uh, I made a strikingly handsome character in Star Citizen. I saw the video. I did not watch it though. <laughs> it's fair. <laughs> I talked to you enough about Star Citizen as it is. You're just like, no, thank you. Uh, I was like, oh, I'm sure. I, I, fig I figured that the character model had come out, or at least like a test version of it, I imagined. Yeah, it's just sort of, it, they just keep rolling out more and more styles to it as it mm -hmm. as it gets bigger. But I was able to get fairly close to creating myself an engine, which was cool. Pretty robust character editor. Uh, I'm impressed with it. It's cool that you can now save your character profile and download it as a file so that if they wipe the server or whatever, you can take it from the test server to the main server or whatever. It's just like a little code that you plug in and then you can be Matimio every time. So, it's cool. It's it's pretty incredible. I, I mean, Dragon's Dogma 2, I basically made myself. I don't know if I showed you that, but I like made myself. Yeah. And it was weird seeing me in a video game. And you're slaying dragons and stuff. Oh, yeah, it was awesome. Slaying other stuff, if you know what I mean. <sighs> well, yeah. It's the ultimate yeah. role-playing experience. You can be yourself in game and just like... Finally getting some action. Hooking up with Yennefer and whatnot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yennefer. It's a good uh -huh. name. I like fantasy names. They're like It's I sort do. of like a normal name, but not... Yennefer. We're just going to replace one letter. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, so, the Star Citizen 3.23 patch is playable on PTU. Wave 1, which means basically a ton more people get into it. And the NDA is off. So, people can record and post videos on it. And it's cool. The servers are chunky, as expected. They're still ironing stuff out. A patch dropped... Today, which would be Monday, the day we're recording the podcast, but uh, Vulcan is now in as a testable oh. alternative to DirectX 11, which the nice. engine currently runs on. So that's going to be huge once they get that ironed out because DLSS is attached to that, and a, DLSS is technically already in the game, but or in the demo version, in the PTU version of the <laughs> demo game. Demo version. De the demo of the demo of the demo is what yeah. Star Citizen is, but... Um, they got some fun little things that popped up that I wasn't expecting, like uh, water now has physics. So if you fly low over an ocean, it kicks up water behind you and it sprays and gets all janky when you drop one of the giant bombs into the water and this giant crazy splash Explosion. comes out of it. Yep. Yeah, that's the, cool. Sh the shockwaves go forever. There's animals now. Nice. There's like um, this weird four-eyed tiger thing that is on micro i think it's on microtech and hurston actually but uh yeah they move in packs and stuff and attack you and whatnot i don't know if you it, can skin them yet uh <laughs> i mean what is this you, red dead redemption like what? yeah bro that's what i, I want to sell freaking alien animal pelts all right that's okay. gonna be my all main right. thing you come on over if you want some of that good alien something i don't know what some they nice are. some nice uh alien meat yeah some steaks Put yep. them on the Barbie. The, <laughs> the map is in. I got to use the map, Matt. Oh, I got to use it? the star map. Uh, you can't, Jason says you can't skin, but you can take their horns. Okay. Oh. Compromise. That's something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you're feeling horny, um, you can, <laughs> sorry for that one. That's okay. The star map is in. It's cool. It works. You can search for stuff. It's got recommended locations. The UI in your spaceship when navigating now makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not spinning around 20 times trying to find the thing I need to jump to. Marking locations. You can pin locations. I haven't tried sending a pin to someone yet, but I think you either you can or that's planned for the very near future. So if I'm like, hey, Matt, I found... I can... Uh, my dead We're body's going here. on this pin. Let's rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, it looks cool. And nice. the interior of spaceships is rendered out in the maps, too. It's freaking sweet. Wow. So, yeah. So you can see all that. Engineering is now in the um, Arena Commander test mode. 
of the PTU. So basically you can load into like a little TDM server and test out the first phase of engineering, which is the like, um, kind of the pirate ship gameplay stuff where you're like fixing stuff. Yeah. You're fixing things inside the ship while it's getting shot at and whatnot. I don't know if that's going to be fun yet. We'll see as far, so far it's like power relays, repairing modules, replacing capacitors. And I'm like, yeah, maybe this is fun, but we'll see. I mean, it's, I mean, if, if, <laughs> if you got a big crew and there's nothing else for the people to do, other than just sit there and wait for the battle to be over, having them at least do something would be kind of fun. Yeah. And Jason in chat says, no, it won't be fun. It's tedium. I know where Jason stands on this, but at the same time, I don't think box stacking is fun, but there's some people that are like, <laughs> let me be the dude who organizes the cargo. I'm like, okay, go for All it. Right, you have, know? have fun there. Get, 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 get to it. They want to be the dude in the cargo room. So there's always somebody who wants to do those weird little roles. Uh, and I think CIG has a pretty good um, mindset about not making you have to do those roles if you don't want to. So if you go into a station and you could like potentially select the replace or repair all my modules and capacitors or something, then then you don't have to like go back there and swap them out. But if you got a crew that's got nothing else to do, they can save you a little bit of time and money by doing it manually, I guess. So that sounds good. Yeah. No, that's cool. There's there's a lot more. There's new cloud tech. There's new the game looks a little different. There's clearly a whole bunch of visual changes for lights and things look cooler when seen from atmosphere. Um, the first iteration of master modes is in, which is like completely different combat stuff. And really the word is out the, what is master mode? It's like, they're limiting the speed at which you can travel. They're trying to make combat and dogfighting closer quarters, closer range. So you're not just shooting at like a little dot on your UI the whole time. Right. Um, Which is what would happen in actual space combat. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you'd never see this. I mean, it's what happens in real aerial combat right now. You launch a missile right. from you don't, like... You just, you don't see them. Yeah. yeah, 100 kilometers away. And you're like, yeah, my radar says I got them, you know? Because <laughs> wasn't, isn't there... I, I thought I, I saw a video or something where... Was it... We have uh, some aircrafts for the United States that aren't in a dogfight they would lose. But they're, they're, they're never in a dogfight because you don't see them coming. And you, you just get hit by the missile. And then they just yeah. win from miles away. <laughs> yeah, essentially. They're, they're not really built for dogfighting and stuff. And I, I don't know if this is still held up in modern military aircraft design, but I think like planes, I think the Phantom from like Vietnam era, I think they made it without machine guns or something on it because they're just like, why would we need those? We've got missiles. And then at some point they started losing in dogfights to people actually shooting them down. And they're like, ah, oh, I guess we should put guns back on the planes now. <laughs> but realistically, most of those aircraft don't need them. I guess they're just there if they're like, well, I don't know, shoot out an engine on this big cargo plane and try and get it to land. I, I But you're not going to be, no, they're not looping around each other, uh, hitting right. each other with bullets as much these days. It's all, it's all missile stuff, you know? Yeah. Long range. Very, very long range. Yeah, super long range. Um, and yeah, so Star Citizen has to create rules to to switch that up. And at the moment, I, I'm seeing a lot of pushback against it in some areas, and some people are touting it. It's just completely redefining the meta, so it just needs time to kind of balance. But you switch in between two different modes now. There's SCM, which is s standard combat mode or something like that. Uh -huh. Um and that's the slower mode and your shields come online and your weapons come online. And then there's your quantum travel mode. And when you switch to that, your shields go away. And I think your weapons go away as well, I believe. Um, and then you can move faster and your quantum drive spools up and you can jump places. So you have gotcha. to make a very you have to make clear a choice. choice. Am I fighting or am I running? And if you don't make the decision quick enough, you're pretty much screwed because apparently the transition time can like, it takes a while to get things spooled up and ready to go. So interesting. Yeah. I, I'm not, I haven't really tested it out extensively, but you know, they're trying to solve a problem and we'll see if it works. Cool. Yeah. So people are getting hyped for the latest patch, but it is, it's still buggy, still laggy. It's still, still star citizen. It is. They do have crash 
recovering now. I've crashed a couple of times and been able to spawn back in and get in the same spot and all that stuff. So I like how that's a, bo- a bonus. I know. Well, I cr- I mean, my game crashed and I got back and I was in the same spot that I was before. Revolutionary. It is a huge deal in Star Citizen. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm all aware, <laughs> but I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's coming along, man. It's exciting. I'm I'm happy for the team over there. They're like they seem happier in their in their Inside Star Citizen episodes. They're like excited okay. and they're like, we get to we get to show you all this cool stuff now, as opposed to trying to like hide everything that we've been working on behind the scenes for years. So right. <clears throat> uh, allegedly, I think um, Invictus launch week is towards the end. Uh, or Fleet Week, I think that's the same thing. Yeah, is towards the end of May, and everybody's assuming that they're trying to get this patch live by by that event. So mm-hmm. it's probably when it's going to come out. But cool. Yeah. So you know, clear out some str- some streaming time for that one, Matt. Uh, I will. I'll have to. Yeah. <laughs> will will do. All right. Aside from oh yeah, well. Uh, I know you have been playing Fallout 76 because you were excited about the show. Yes. The show has dropped. Yes. How much of the show have you watched? All of it. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> it's so, it's so good, Charlie. It's so, so I watched, good. I watched the first episode and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. It, the way that it's able to blend the like seriousness of like what the actual setting is like, like how, Mm -hmm. like it would be terrible to live there. Right. Oh my God. There's like some really good, great serious moments, but then they blend in just the absurdity of the fallout universe so well. And they don't seem to clash completely, which is nice. Yeah. And I, 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 like I'm laughing all the time. Uh, I care about the characters. Some characters do really stupid things. Uh, Maximus, the, yeah, the, he he does some stupid stuff, but I still like him as a character, um, especially later on. Like his, the 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 war that goes on in his head and like his expressions is so great at times. Yeah, and yeah, it's it is fantastic. I really really enjoyed the entire thing. The opening scene for it with, I mean, it's not really a spoiler. We know nukes come down essentially, but like the back chilling. Yeah, man, was that an effective scene. That was pretty yeah. wild to watch. Um, yeah. Incredible stuff. It's sort of, it, yeah, it is a weird blend of, like, this scene is really moving, where you're mm-hmm. watching humanity essentially get eradicated through their own stupidity. And yep. at the same time, there's just weird, goofy things happening within yep. the universe, and you're like... Somehow it, pl- it wanders between those two worlds, and you're like, I guess we can have it both ways. It's, yeah, it's and weird. they and they do a really good job of it. Like a little bit like a serious scene, all of, all of a sudden out of nowhere, you just see a guard get taken out by a junk launcher, where a doll is just sticking at, you know yeah. through his chest. And you're just like, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like, great. what happened? Yeah, I guess they don't have a lot of bullets in the future. Yeah. You'd, you'd need to shoot other things. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, I'm curious about Maximus's character too, having only seen the first episode. I'm sort of looking at these characters as like, yeah, what would you be like if you grew up in this night dystopian nightmare and right. like didn't have a good upbringing? Like, yeah, your your brain would be kind of all over the place. Yep. Yeah. I really I I actually think that they the show does a really good job of not summarizing, but telling a really succinct story for a lot of these factions that does come across in the games obviously but i feel like it does a v- almost a almost a better job in some cases of just like telling the story and knowing what they're like what these factions their goals are yeah. and not having to go through like 10 hours of gameplay to be like oh that's why they're doing what they're doing yeah which, which is nice because yeah, yeah. for a show you need you kind of need that it does help i i know playing like fallout you know, when you meet the, what is it? The Brotherhood of Steel, the armored yep. guys. Yeah. You don't really know what they're about for a while. You sort of yeah. pick up little lines here and there from different NPCs and then you meet them and they're all hardcore and whatever. And you're like, okay, but you don't really, you don't totally get it right away. It takes a while before you're like, oh, okay, these guys are crazy, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Um, I mean, pretty much everyone's crazy. But everybody's yeah. crazy just in their own different way. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> 
their own brand of crazy. So it's really, it's pretty impressive that they sunk that much money into a show and that it somehow turned out good. Oh, the vaults are so good too. Like they're yeah. really well realized. They look like a vault, like 100%. Yeah. I think the vault part of the first episode is my favorite part of the episode. Yeah. Cause you're just like, this environment is so kooky and enjoyable and they're sort of innocent, but sort of not. It's like they're innocent in the way that they haven't had to like be exposed to the outside world too much, but also they're very much aware of the imminent threat at all times to the outside world. So they're not like right. completely unprepared for it. And they seem to bounce back pretty well from horrific situations, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. And, well, yeah, the vaults are, are really a key component of the game because yeah. they're they're I don't, I don't want to get into spoilers, but yeah, they're they're a big part of of the Fallout universe, not just because they're for survivors, but because things happened in the vaults, right. which is what you'll figure out later on in the if, in the show if you aren't familiar with the Fallout universe. Gotcha. What is um? So what's Vault seventy six then? Uh, actually haven't, so I've, I'm playing Vault, I'm playing Fallout 76 and I, yeah. I really, really enjoy it. It's a super chill, like cozy game. I have not gone to Vault 76 or back to it to figure out exactly what its purpose was. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I have gone uh, through another vault, which was pretty awesome. And the story, you basically just have to like read. It's a lot of reading, which I don't mind, but you kind of have to just see what happens to these vault dwellers and mm -hmm. some of them are pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah, I know you're just locked underground and like all kinds of things can happen. Yep. Um, Jason says in comment in the comments right now that he's never played the games uh, and he thought the world building could have been fleshed out a little bit better for some of the newbies who just had no context. That's I mean, that's fair. It's hard yeah. for me to know exactly because yeah. I, you know, I've experienced Fallout before. I, I'm not like a, a Fallout enthusiast, but I played 3-4, now 76. So I do enjoy the world. But yeah, when you have like literally no context, I could see where it maybe get a little, gets a little confusing because all of a sudden ghouls just show up and you're like, what is, is this? Is this a fantasy show? Is this, you know, what, what are we watching right now? Because it looks like it's grounded in somewhat of reality. And then yeah. you have essentially zombies, you know? <laughs> Yeah, zombies with personality. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. whatever. Yeah, that is a weird line to run. I remember feeling that way about the Harry Potter movies where uh, it had, they came out so long after the books were initially released. Um, it, was, it was a while between the books and the movies. That I, I think that... Okay, go on. Well, I forgot, essentially, the details of the books. Yeah. And then the movies came out, and I was like, oh, I think they're relying on me having all the book knowledge to make mm. this all make sense together. It sort of felt like rush snapshots of different parts of the world at points where I was like, Oh, I don't know how well this works as like a standalone without the book knowledge to like make mm. it interesting. You know, I was like, Oh, well there was enough of a fan base of the books that it didn't really matter where everybody was like, Oh my God, the movies are so good. It's like, I yeah, guess but I kind of disagree a little bit, but I, oh, I mean, okay. I, I can see where you're coming from. But maybe maybe it's because I was in the books growing up and I just I don't know. Yeah, uh, I, I do think that they flesh out the world pretty well, though. So I don't, I don't think like you you don't need to know Fallout to, I think, appreciate Fallout. The yeah. Show. And I don't know the Fallout world that well either. Like, I mean, it's been a while since I've been in, in a deep into a Fallout game. So, you know, I know the basics, but I'm not like intimately familiar with all the mantras and stuff. And yeah, I was having a blast with the with the show, and I'm gonna I'm excited to come back in and finish it out. I did. Uh, I was just like reading an article about like some movies and stuff, um, and I ended up watching a, a movie from the '70s that I hadn't seen in a long time, but it made me really appreciate just the art of filmmaking because usually when you go back and watch an old movie from like the '70s, you're like, oh boy. Here we go with like either really dated technology, bad cinematography, or like really bad pacing. But yeah, this movie had none of that. Um, wow, it's it's about Mozart. It's called Amadeus. Have you seen it? it sounds like a snooze, right? 
it's yep. very entertaining from start to finish um because the life of nice. mozart's pretty entertaining and it's funny it's kind of like a dark comedy to a degree it's got it was all the this... 70s huh yeah the um the main actor oh was it from the 80s well look it up jason <laughs> jason and chess like i thought it was from the 80s um i think it's 70s but i could be wrong anyway um 1980s okay um it's now i lost my train of thought it's just uh it's really well shot the pacing is on point and you learn a lot about mozart and all this stuff and i i thought i would be bored i thought i would fall asleep because a lot of what mozart did was write operas right and nothing can put me to sleep faster than an opera um <laughs> i i watched this video to go to sleep i was trying to, i was trying to take a nap what is it what what is this entertainment yeah I yeah hear, i hear you I have uh, my poor wife. She's she likes musicals, and she's brought me to multiple musicals. And I think I've fallen asleep in like almost all of them. And I've been to a, a bunch live with performance? her. Yeah, <laughs> I've fallen Ooh. asleep. Oh no! I'm just like <sighs> just completely knock, just out. out. There's a few that I managed to like sort of like slap myself through, kind of. But they're long, you know. They're like three hours or something. Yeah, they're just not. Like, they're not yeah. short. But anyway, so I fall asleep during a musical, but this movie, fantastic. The uh, the lead actor won uh, Best Actor for his role in this one. So I thought if anybody's like, you know what? I want to go back in time. I want to see some of the old great films. This one holds up, like, without question. Fantastic nice. movie. Entertaining. Educational. Little blast from the past into one of the greatest composers of all time. And the interesting thing about the whole... Th whole movie is that like and this i guess is true for a lot of famous artists of their time is that they're often unappreciated during their lifetime and the appreciation comes later where they're like oh why do i still remember this song oh maybe because this guy was a genius as opposed to whatever's you know the latest trendy right. song there was the a time. there was i think doctor who episode where they brought back a an artist to the future so that they could show how much their art meant to people in the future. And yeah. it was like really emotional. I've never seen um, the show, but I saw that clip and I was like, damn, that's actually really, really kind of cool. Cause yeah, they, they did not realize how much their art meant to so many people. Yeah. It's kind of wild <laughs> to think about it too. And uh, really unfortunate because so many of the artists are tortured souls to a degree, yep. you know, which is why they get to where they are. Cause they are driven by often unhealthy inspirations and, uh, unfortunate things that have happened to them throughout life. Or and then they... it comes through their their art, which then people relate to, which is what makes them incredible artists. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my that's my movie recommendation of the week. Highly recommend it. Put it on your list. Go back. Check it out. Uh, holds up, man. I like fast-paced action movies, and I was entertained the whole time through this one. Nice. Yep. Sick. You learn. Yeah, and you learn you learn about Salieri, you know, another Italian oh, yeah, Sally, composer. Old Salieri, huh? But it's a great it's a great story, you know. Just <laughs> ah, it's fun stuff. And the guy who plays nice. Mozart, I don't I don't think I've seen him in anything before, but he's very funny too. Um, mm. Yeah. So see the drama uh, around uh, Star Wars Outlaws. Not not that drama, but the drama that actually matters. I don't think so. No, the I mean, price. I saw a couple, the price, oh no, what's the price? Yeah, so it's $70 if you get the base game, but if you want to get the, like, deluxe edition, it's like $130. <laughs> Disney, you mother flipping. <laughs> God. It's so, ex it's so expensive. And now we've learned that apparently there's even, like, some DLC, like there's a um, Job of the Hutt uh, DLC that's or like a mission. There's a so mission that is. I guess my question is: is d is the deluxe edition actually extra content? Like, is it? Are so you not going to be getting with, the full game experience unless you get the deluxe edition? So apparently, there will be like a mission that you do not get. I believe. Okay. Uh, I'll have maybe I should maybe I should have done more research, but yeah. So I I just learned about this right before the podcast. At least that particular caveat. But the game. So the seventy dollars version should give you basically the full game. But the deluxe edition, or whatever it's called, will give you the DLC as well, which is fine. 
But like, man, the game isn't, this is what frustrates me is they're harping on people. It's like, oh yeah, you want all the content, right? Which is okay. But we don't even know what the game is going to be yeah. like. No one's played the game. And then on top of that, we're just trusting that the DLC is going to be good. Like, I think not only consumers, are you trusting that the game is good, but we don't even know what the DLC is. I think consumers really need to use their better judgment on this one. Because one, this is not a tried and true franchise that you know what you're going to get. This is a brand new game that yeah. you don't know. You don't know if you're going to like it. You don't know if it's going to be good. It's it's a giant Star Wars game, which means I say it has just as good a chance of being great as it does terrible. Like it's 50-50, mm -hmm. which kind of is the Star Wars track record for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, how about 130 bucks? And you're like, what is this? Like, this how about isn't no. Yeah, this isn't a Zelda game that I know is right. going to be fantastic. Like, I'm not giving that to you. Uh, yeah. Like, earn it, right? If the game's good, come out with a DLC for 40 bucks or whatever, and maybe I'll buy that. But they just want all the money. They, can, they, they can't be satisfied with a little bunny. They want all the money. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I would not pay that much money for a single player star. It is single player, right? There's no yeah. multi. Yeah. Yep. It's a lot. It's a lot of money. And I mean, it's funny because have... I feel like in the past, $130 would give you like the collect, maybe not entirely, but you know, when you get like the physical collector's edition where it comes with like a map and maybe like a little figurine, I felt like that not that long ago was this price tag. And now we're just digital the yeah. entire thing. Like, what is going on? Yeah. You know what is weird, though? And not to so much defend publishers, but everything has increased with inflation, except video games seem like they have either more or less stayed the same or gone down in price in a lot of ways. Well, you say that, but then they find other means to monetize their title with microtransactions sure. and with this, with a you know $130 version of their video game. So it feels like the $70 is more of just like the entry fee now yeah. than anything else. I bought um, Shadows of the Empire on the Nintendo mm -hmm. 64 while I was, must have been high school. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe like early high school or even middle school. It could have been middle school. But... It was seventy dollars mm -hmm. for the little cartridge. It wasn't a All sixty dollar and version. Back then, it and that, back then, it was even more expensive because it that the value of a dollar was much more. Yep, and uh, it was single player only. Play through it. There wasn't like all these alternative playthrough options. It right. was like you got like ten levels or whatever it was, and after that, the game was over. And yeah. I enjoyed it, but I do remember looking back on that as being like a really expensive purchase for the amount of content I got out of it and thinking uh -huh. like, that might have not been the best money spent. You know, like I've gotten, I've played other video games where I got way more time out of them. And that's sort of like the first time where I was like, 70 bucks was a lot to me back then, you know? So it was like, dang, like most video games are 50 bucks, right? Around that range, 50, 60, but 70 and to get less content, I had to sort of step back. But looking at it now, having the games be the same price, like 20-ish years later, you know? Yeah. Um, it is interesting. And part of that is that video games have become one of the the biggest uh, media well, consumption in the world. Right. So the competition has driven the prices down in many ways, but... Yeah. So I, I hear you and I, I get that, but also it was more niche back then. You have a niche product, everything's going to be more expensive because yeah. there's just not enough people to sustain it. Now, as you said, it's one of the biggest industries in the entire world. Uh, game just, you, I have a hard time sympathizing with the game industry when they say that they like they make more money than ever before. It's the largest in the entire, you know, in the world. And they're like, but we're not making enough money. It's like, hmm, okay. So it makes it hard to sympathize. So I think it's that plus this and also um there's there, it's basically like an entry fee they're already kind of nickel and diamond yeah. you like i just said in other in uh, other ways so i I, th I think it sucks because there the game industry has become less stable in my opinion in terms of success versus failure like mm -hmm. uh you're looking at all these big money games that just completely bomb and then other ones that blow it out of the 
water like like nobody's business and make 10x the amount that yeah. people were expecting and there's not a whole lot of in between it almost feels and so they're just setting up like hey if this succeeds we need it to make a sh- like so much more money than than just good it needs to be better than good it needs to be insane right and so they're not shooting for fair and reasonable they're shooting for over the top with like every title and then if it bombs they're like well we just took a huge loss because they these big studios do take massive losses on games 50 100 million dollar production budgets that like return almost nothing right and they're like oh crap we just have to eat that loss and so they're trying to make it back up on other titles so rather than getting this more fair tempered ex- situation where you can expect things and and get a reasonable product with a reasonable amount of amount of microtransactions and DLC and all that stuff you're getting super aggressive products nonstop because it's more reliant on that one title that blows up out of the five that they made or whatever. And I think consumers are a little bit to be blamed for that because we reward those big bombastic games that are just incredible and you know, your Red Deads, your Grand Theft Autos, your really big titles that have an, ent- an incredible amount of effort and money put into it. And it shows and they're rewarded for it. But then you have other companies trying to emulate that larger scale. And Starfield. yeah, yeah they, they, they are successful in some cases. But at the same time, because there's so many companies making these large $100 million video games there's only so many people like, yes, it might be the biggest industry, but there's only so many video games. People yeah. only have so much money and time, time in particular. Yeah. Eventually so people are going to wanna go want to go take some grass, man. <laughs> right. And, and if your game, even though you put a lot of money into it, doesn't mean it's going to necessarily be a 10 out of 10. And there are a lot of great 10 out of 10s because there's so many games out there these days. People are going to be able to ch- pick and choose what they want. And so a new big title comes out, People may just overlook it because there are so many other options. Yeah. So wild. I mean, generally speaking, it's pretty fantastic for game consumers. Not that for the most life part. in general or the economy is, but <laughs> the the game marketplace choices for them is pretty fantastic right now. But I imagine it's got to level out a little bit more. Um, I'm working on a video right now. I might be live by the time this podcast is but it's about a game that costs 140 million dollars to make that uh you haven't heard about Mm -hmm. i guarantee you or you if you did hear about it was more in like hey did you hear this game flopped and then you're like 140 million and and i haven't even heard of it yeah will smith is in it do you know what i'm talking about now yeah i know yeah 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 so i i dove into that i think we might have talked about in the podcast a little while ago we did actually played it and it is wild. It's, 10 out of 10. It's, it's like, it's a very Asian marketed game in the sense where one, I didn't see Will Smith. Two, everybody <laughs> looks like some sort of model, you know? Yep. They're like yep. running around in like designer jeans while fighting zombies with spiky hair and stuff. I mean, I want to, I want to look hot. Are you kidding me? The apocalypse is just like this weird thing where you're just like, I don't, what do you mean it's the apocalypse? You have w- one of the gameplay mechanics is running a, a washing machine to clean your clothes. So you look hot and fresh. I'm like, what apocalypse is this? This is insane. <laughs> People are supposed to be darvi- dying and starving. And then I'm taking hot baths and washing my clothes like in a plush townhouse. You know, it's insanity. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, one of the characters, Oh man, I wish I could watch you just stream this and get to this moment in the game, but you shouldn't play this because it's awful. Okay. But it's like right after a mission and there's this girl who's like been following, been um kind of guiding you through, through some of the early game content and missions, uh, breaks out into a musical number. Okay. And it's like, it's like a K-pop type thing where she's just like, sing it sounds like a really trashy taylor swift song or something and you just sit through it she's singing about like being lonely in the apocalypse or some crap and it's insane and then it just like cuts back to the gameplay and you're like what just happened it's was that a fever dream that's great yeah that does that does sound like yeah 
But I, apparently I get they didn't even from. make like a million bucks on that game. Oh my god, that's awful. Yeah, Holy cow. So 140 40 million dollars. Most of which yeah. I would ma- imagine went into Will Smith's pocket because he was like all over the trailers for it. Yeah. Uh, not him, uh, a 3D model of him. So I don't right. even think he showed up. I think he just like let them scan him or something. And then he's like, all right, I'll take that giant paycheck now and you can make this mediocre game. I'm but, sure he didn't get, you know, tens of millions of dollars, no. but I'm sure he got paid a, a decent amount. Yeah. No, uh, people were there's no way that 140 million dollars went into the production of that game because or even close because usually the rule of thumb is two-thirds of the budget goes into marketing and one-third goes into actual development that's That's, wild that's pretty common across the industry and it is kind of disgusting really yeah but uh that's just what it is but even then this game would have around 40 something million dollars to make a game which is not nothing that's a crap load of money and i'm just playing it like where'd the money go the amount of yeah. bugs and problems with this game is insane so somebody was just giving themselves a huge paycheck but it is interesting to watch these massive investments from massive corporations and go nowhere like, yeah so you're like oh they're trying to make it up in other ways you know and yeah um, it all comes back to call of duty at the end of the day you know everybody's like well <laughs> Everything's failing. Let's just go play COD now, you know? Yep. What's the latest we'll board we'll DLC? Clone. Yeah. Yeah. It's every board meeting. is how can we make this more like COD? What's COD doing? And apparently COD's even having problems too. Is it? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't think Call of Duty is, is as popular as it once was. I think, especially mm-hmm. this most recent... Um, game modern warfare 3 was a bit of a well was a letdown for a lot of people because it was just a rehash of uh modern warfare 2 it was it was remastered and it was meant yeah yeah originally designed to be a dlc and it was fun it was i guess i almost look at cod as more of warzone as than anything right oh well yeah that's true because that's sort of what i think warzone's been struggling as well i don't Hmm. think it's it's definitely because during the whole you know lockdown period it it, everything was massive, and including that in particular. That was the right time. You know, they're in the right place at the right time, and well, things yeah. have kind of fallen fallen down a bit. I'm a little worried about some of the messaging about the upcoming Battlefield stuff because they keep talking about this connected universe, right? That's like their the mm-hmm. line that they keep bringing up, where they're like, "It's a connected space and universe and whatever." And I'm like looking at COD games, and they keep bringing back all their stupid characters into every cod game you know like oh yeah I, lo- I love soap and whatever you know and you're just like who cares about these nothing burger characters that keep showing up and then they're all they all know each other and then they're all like monologuing over each other and you're like what is that this franchise has become so silly but i'm worried that battlefield is like we need characters that k- keep showing up and become our connected characters oh, and yeah. weaving storylines and i'm like think of that it's my least favorite part of the whole call of duty franchise is they're terrible characters that they just are like oh look it's so and so showed up they're, and they're cool characters like they're badass but they have actual like very little v- character other yeah. than I say gruff things every once in a while and sound really cool. Yeah. Other than that, they're very one dimensional. Yeah. It's the fast and furious effect, right? Where you're just like, I mean, how many more times can we watch Vin Diesel say some dumb one liner and then like punch some guy and you're like, all right, this is even a person. But we have family. Yeah. (laughs) Family. I'm going to punch. And then Jason Statham shows up and they're just like one lining each other to death. And you're just like, I can't. They're not characters. They're just like ridiculousness and COD is that. So I hope Battlefield doesn't go down this character route. Like I just, the fan base just doesn't want it, but we'll see. I hope connected I means something else, man. I hope we'll connected see. is like, I don't know. You can choose which part of Battlefield you want to play as opposed to, and have it be connected together. I'm not, I don't know. The single player yeah. connected to the multiplayer connected to the, the free Royale stuff. I don't know. I assume that's I mean, what I'm, it's I'm okay mean. with the single player connecting to the multiplayer in the sense like this is a location that was in the single player yeah. and there's like a story to be told, but that's pretty common uh, though. And that hasn't yeah. changed, right? That would be right. Battlefield three, bad company Two, all that stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm worried about what 
connected universe means exactly. Could but... just be a bunch of corporate mumbo jumbo to try to get investors involved. Who knows? Yeah, I will say I am just so sick of take any of the big companies, EA, Ubisoft, whatever, uh, Activision. Well, I guess that'd be Microsoft now, but uh, just all their vague marketing spiel on everything. You're like, can you just tell us something? Or can you just, just be transparent for once? Just for once, you know, uh, it's just no. all these press events are like, no. oh, so that was like a bunch of vague nothingness. Cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. Fun stuff, you know, that's why it's so much more fun to follow indie devs, I find these days, because they're just like, they don't have all these weird NDA legal requirements. They're just like, this is what I'm working on. Uh, I don't want to tell you about this next thing because it's a surprise. And people are like, okay, cool. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, that's neat. We can yeah. we can yeah. wait. And then they'll even tell you stuff like, hey, this was hard. I couldn't figure this out. Or I really wanted to make this work, but uh, it just wasn't in the end of the day. So uh, I cut it or whatever. And you just have this more natural dialogue with the, the developers and people respect them even when they fail because they're just sort of honest about it. And then the relationship with like the big scene, they're all trying to replicate that. They can't because they've got like a mountain of lawyers telling them what they can and can't say. Right. And the marketing team being like, no, only positive speak. You can't, you can't admit failure or like you made a mistake at any point. Or they, you know? or they show like someone's on stage playing the game. It's like, mm -hmm, yeah, they're playing the game. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's this whole very scripted, what looks like basically a one for one script of them playing the game. I don't know what you're talking about. I really related to Trevor Noah when he announced Battlefield 5. Uh, was it? Yeah. I think it was Battlefield 5. BF 5, where he was talking about playing the old Battlefield games with his friends and what they meant to him and stuff. I was like, man, this is not scripted at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 just because they're celebrities doesn't mean they play video games, but they're also just, there to do a job. Yeah, no, but it was just poorly timed because you're like know your audience guys like nobody yeah. here is buying this like come on yeah. nobody's like oh Trav Noah likes the game I'm gonna buy I'm gonna it buy it now I'm gonna buy it now it will be great yeah uh, okay we're getting a bit cynical anything else cool that you played what's content warning I, I keep seeing that game pop up here and there and I'm like what so the heck like is this uh what is, it's called it's like lethal company do you know what that is yeah where you go down mm -hmm. and you need to do tasks and things to and there's monsters it's that but it's but it's made by the totally i think it's made by the people that made totally accurate battlegrounds where it's like super goofy mm. um but so you basically play as these characters where you have a camera and you need to film monsters and try to survive with the camera and you actually f you film them you actually yeah. film them and then when you're done you only got like so much uh, of a camera yeah. and then, you, then after you're done with it you can watch it and you try to get views like on youtube and so you basically make little home videos with you and your friends and it's hilarious because you'll try to like set up the scene be like okay we're going down into the tunnels we'll see what happens and the next scene is just ah it's after us please <laughs> <laughs> that does make me happy. I mean, yeah. it's like it is the everybody's hating on, uh, you know, vlog streamer vloggers and all that kind of silly lifestyle and the people dancing in public and whatever. Uh -huh. And like, yeah, it kind of scratches that little nostalgic itch or that not nostalgic itch it's, that it's that desire found, to see something bad happen to them. It's basically found footage that you are creating, you know, yeah. like found footage horror. It's like that. But you are you're the one creating it, which is which is fun. So who watches the footage afterwards? Like, do you rewatch it? You, like, no. So it, it's, it, yeah, you can rewatch it. There's a, there's a big TV. Everyone goes around. They sit around. You watch like 30 seconds of it. Okay. And you'll see like the views go up. I don't know how the views really count. I think it might be based off of like maybe how many enemies you see, what mm. happens to your, like your teammates, because they can get like, you know, shanked in front of you. And then, uh, <laughs> and that's I think a that lot of views right there. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's it's a really f fun little concept, and it's obviously very heavily inspired by Lethal Company, and it does a pretty good job of it. Uh, I think it's it's an early access, so it's, I'm sure they're going to be adding more. How inspired do you think it is, considering how close it is to Lethal? Inc I mean, 
incredibly inspired. Well, but I mean, Lethal Company came out pretty recently. Like, you can't just make a game in like a couple of months and be like, hey, here's our whole thing. And it looks just like Lethal Company. I mean, maybe. It might not be directly inspired. There's always that possibility, but... Do you think they made a bunch of changes, like, towards the end that were like, make it more like Lethal Company? I, well, I don't, I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, I would not be surprised if they saw the success of Lethal Company and this is basically a response to it. Yeah. Okay. Jason says, yeah, you can. If you see the polish on it, you'll get it. It's pretty, it's pretty bare bones. When you, Fair yeah. enough. You can make a jank game in a couple of in a few months. With and a, it is pretty jank. Team. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. As long you know, it's funny. I notice more indie games are sort of adopting that jank uh, presentation, like they're yeah. like trying to say like, "Hey, this is intentionally the way the game is," and it's it's pretty smart in terms of yeah, if your game isn't super well polished, it kind of fits the MO, right? You're like, hey, well, it's supposed to be a little little janky and the animation's a little quirky and the textures kind of suck and the lighting kind of sucks, you know? And you're like, it's supposed to be that way. Not because we needed to make it super quick or on a low budget or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Intentional. Ah, but I hear yeah. You. I think low, like low poly and retro style games done right do take a lot of time to get right. So there's, yeah, there's sort of this weird realm of jank games that somehow get a pass. Uh, Anyway, you want to wrap the pod there, man? What, uh, sounds good. What good advice do you have for, for our peoples? So my advice, if you guys can't tell, um, I've got a heating pad. My advice as you get older is to stretch your back yeah what'd you do was Take it uh, i don't know streaming bro. for have, 10 hours a day every I've, single day of the week was it that probably yeah i've been trying to exercise but maybe that is common i got a new pillow maybe the pillow isn't working it's i just i go to sleep and i wake up with headaches it's off i am i am a mess level oh, cap. no matt headaches. I'm a mess. uh do you grind are you a teeth grinder I I mean I do some grinding, but I don't know if it's my teeth. <laughs> yeah, those uh those full body pillows. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> what's the one? What's your name? Which is the one you married? I uh... I didn't marry my body pillow, please. And it's yeah. all might. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> uh well, once again, people, thank you so much for watching. If you want to support the podcast, check us out on Patreon. If you don't want to subscribe to Patreon, just, you know, and you enjoyed it, give us a like and do all that normal YouTube stuff. Subscribe, hit that notification bell thing. It'll make us happy. Matt and I will make more money. And uh, we know what makes Matt happy. It's those cold... Love. Yeah, love and money. And, and money. money. Cold, and hard money. cash. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching, everybody. We appreciate you. We'll see you next podcast. Peace out. Take care.